In this picture, you see the sun with some kind of a halo around it. What's causing this phenomena? Turns out that it's got something to do with the fact that when you shoot a light through a parallel side glass lab, the ray emerges out without any deviation parallel to the incident ray. But if we shot the same ray on a prism where the two sides are not parallel to each other, then the ray of light does get deviated compared to the incident ray. So let's see in this video how this mere fact that the ray of light through a prism gets deviated results in something so beautiful like this. So let's say we have a prism in which the refracting surfaces are making an angle A and the material is made up of refractive index N. So if you shoot a ray of light on the first surface, it would have gone this way, but it's going to bend over here. To do that bending, we're gonna draw a normal. Now if you consider the outside medium to be just air, then the ray is moving from a rarer medium into a denser medium, so it's gonna bend towards the normal, downwards. And so the ray of light has bent downwards Let's call that angle as D1. Now again, if it wasn't for refraction over here, it would have gone this way, but again, it's going to bend over here, so we're gonna draw another normal. And now this ray is moving from a denser to rarer medium, as a result, it's gonna bend away from the normal, again, downwards. And if we call this second angle as D2, then this total deviation, the total deviation that our incident ray has suffered, turns out to be D1 plus D2. So the total deviation D is D1 plus D2. And if we were to call the angle of incidence over here as I, and say we were to analyze this whole situation carefully, then it turns out that these angles D1 and D2 really only depend on the angle of incidence I, the refractive index N, and the angle of the prism A. Now, in this video, we're not going to do that analysis, we'll do it in another video, but if we were to do that analysis, then we would see that the equation for D, the total deviation, turns out to be this. The equation seems extremely scary, it's popping out of nowhere, but like I said, this equation really comes if we were to analyze this properly and use Snell's law and some geometry, which we will do in another video. So don't worry about where this equation comes from. We don't even have to remember this equation. All that matters is look at that uh, angle of deviation. As mentioned, it only depends on the angle of incidence I, the refractive index N, and the angle of the prism A. That's all that matters. And for a given prism, if you have a particular prism, then the value of A and N are fixed numbers. Which means for a given prism, the angle of deviation only depends on the angle of incidence. That's one of the key takeaways of this video. The deviation only depends on the angle of incidence. But of course, just by looking at this equation, at least for me, it's almost impossible to understand how D varies with I. For example, if I were to increase, if the angle of incidence were to increase, would, do, would D increase or would it decrease? That's something that we cannot figure out just by looking at this equation because there's an I here as well. I don't know whether there's gonna be a positive number or a negative number. So you know what people do? Usually people will draw a graph of D versus I and analyze that instead. Again, plotting that graph manually is going to be very difficult, but we have computers to do that. So if we were to put this equation and plot a graph out of it, we would get this. And you gotta admit, this is way easier to analyze compared to that scary equation. And it's probably why those equations are not usually included in the textbook, but they draw this graph. But of course, the graph really comes from that equation. Anyways, if you were to look at this graph carefully, let's see how this angle of deviation, this is the angle of deviation, changes with the angle of incidence. If you start all the way from zero, angle of incidence is zero, then D will have some value. But now, as we increase the angle of incidence, notice the angle of deviation starts decreasing. Look at that angle of deviation starts decreasing, decreases, 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 hits a minimum value, and then further increasing the angle of incidence, the deviation starts increasing. Can you see that? This is the key takeaway of this entire video, that the angle of deviation has a minimum value. So what does that mean? Well, let's take an example. If that minimum value was, say, as an example, 15 degrees, which means if we take our prism and shoot a ray of light, then regardless of the angle of incidence, meaning regardless of how this prism is oriented, we know for sure that the angle of deviation, this angle 
has to be larger than or equal to 15 degrees. It cannot be smaller than 15 degrees. It can be larger, but it cannot be smaller than 15 degrees. 15 is just an example. That is the key takeaway over here. And guess what? This is the very reason we see that halo around the sun. So let's understand how. Say you are looking at the sky, say pointing towards the sun. Then this is the sunlight that's reaching towards you. And let's say there were some prisms suspended in the air somehow. Now these prisms are all oriented randomly, let's say, so the angle of incidence everywhere is different. But one thing's for sure, the emergent ray is deviated by at least 15 degrees or more, but not less. Now, if the rays of light from these prisms were to reach your eye, then these prisms will start glowing. So let's consider one ray of light that reaches your eye. Now, the important thing over here is that the angle of deviation, this angle of deviation that that ray has suffered, is the same angle that is subtended right at your eye. Can you see that? This angle is the same as this angle. So we can say even this angle is the angle of deviation. And as a result, if this angle is greater than 15 degrees, then the ray of light can reach your eye. But if that, but that, if that angle is smaller than 15 degrees, that ray cannot reach your eye. So for example, if you were to draw a ray of light from this prism to th from your eye, and let's say this angle turns out to be less than 15 degrees, then that is not possible. That means the ray of light from this prism cannot reach your eye because to do that, the angle of deviation has to be smaller than 15 degrees. So what will happen is that the ray of light from here will miss your eye. Similarly, the ray of light from here will miss your eye. They cannot reach your eye. So only those rays of light will reach your eye where the angle is greater than 15 degrees. Something like this. So if this angle is 15 degrees, all these prisms can shoot the rays of light right to your eyes, but any prisms over here cannot shoot the rays to your eyes. And as a result, none of these prisms will glow for you. You'll only see these prisms glowing. So far, so good. The hard part is done. But this was in 2D, but our world is in 3D. So let's take this one step further. Here we have drawn the same situation, but in three dimension. It's the same thing. If you were to take rays of light from here, this angle is more than 15 degrees. If you take rays of light from here, this angle has to be greater than 15 degrees. And that's why these prisms inside are not glowing. But guess what? There are prisms above you and below you as well. So the same thing holds for those prisms as well. For any ray of light from the above prisms to reach your eye, this angle, again, has to be larger than 15 degrees. So only those prisms above that 15 degrees angle you can, will glow for you. And the prisms below 15 degrees will not glow for you. And the same thing we can say below. 15 degrees and below, the prisms will glow. And we can do this in all directions. In any direction, as long as the angle is more than 15 degrees, those prisms will glow. The ones smaller than 15 degrees won't glow. And when you put all those glowing prisms together, you end up with a circle. We can also imagine these rays of light which are reaching your eyes are forming a cone. And the base of that cone will glow if that angle is greater than 15 degrees. If it is smaller than 15 degrees, the base won't glow. Now, of course, remember, 15 degrees was just an example. If the minimum deviation of this prism value was, say, I don't know, maybe 22 degrees, then we would see a circle that would obtain an angle of at least 22 degrees. And that's exactly what's happening over here. There are a lot of prisms suspended in the air, and it turns out that the minimum deviation angle of all those prisms, they turn out to be about 22 degrees. So this is called as a 22 degree halo. Any prism inside the 22 degrees will not glow, and that's why this is appearing dark for us. At 22 degrees, it's glowing nicely. About 22 degrees is also glowing, and that's the whole reason for this 22 degrees glow. And these prisms are formed by the ice crystals suspended in the air. So only when you have these ice crystals, you see this amazing glow. So to quickly summarize, any ray of light that is shot through a prism will suffer a deviation. And that angle of deviation has some minimum value. That's the key takeaway. Now what's mind-boggling for me is that this fact that rays of light have a minimum deviation value, which sounds like some boring textbooky kind of fact, 
directly results in this beautiful phenomena that is truly amazing.